Salt Spring Island, British Columbia, Canada, home of internationally acclaimed wildlife artist and naturalist Robert Bateman and his wife Birgit. Before he became world famous, Bateman inspired hundreds of high school art students in Burlington, Ontario, including me. Our paths crossed often over the years as we reunited for news stories and TV segments I hosted as a broadcast journalist during his shows in Eastern Canada. But it was a dream come true to finally visit him in his art studio and home the year he turned 81. I was always an artist. I got serious when I was 12. Uh, I did nature art until I was from 12 to 18. And then uh, a fellow well, no, he, was, he was older than I was, he was a, much more mature, he was 20. And he, uh, he said, you can't do real art with a small brush. You have to get a, a big fat brush and slap on the paint. That's what real art is. So I said, okay, so I, I became an impressionist with a bigger brush and then a post-impressionist. And all through my 20s, I went through these phases that art was going through. Cubist, then... Um, finally abstract expressionist when I was around 30. So I went through all those phases, but always painting in nature, but painting abstract uh, style in, in nature. His studio abounds with decades old tools of his lifelong trade. Uh, it, it's such a fabulous brush and it still comes to a point. I can push hard and paint a big fat line, or I can have it very delicate and do just a slender little twig or something like that with it. His art hangs in palaces around the world, has been shown in exhibits from the Smithsonian Institute to St. Petersburg, Russia. And this is where he continues his work as one of the greatest wildlife artists of our time. Moving here in the mid-80s, Toronto-born Bateman jokes about being a transplant from Ontario, explaining how, after several visits, he fell in love with the island's beauty and the naturalist culture. I asked him how living here has influenced his art. That's an interesting question because uh, where I am doesn't influence my art, but it influences my psyche, which eventually comes through in my art. It's interesting that the first few years I was on Salt Spring Island painting Ontario uh, because Salt Spring hadn't permeated my psyche yet. And I wasn't thinking about it, but I had tons of ideas from the Niagara Escarpment and from, from where, where I lived up North Burlington. And uh, so I would think, look for an idea to do a painting and it was either that or off in Africa because Africa is my other love. You say surprise is a key element of your work. It's a virtue to be fresh in art, especially when you get to be an old goat <laughs> or long in the tooth or whatever the saying is. I think that um, often artists get, um, they get a, a successful formula. So they just start copying themselves and cranking out. I call them pot boilers. And they may be very beautifully done pot boilers, but they're just cranked out over and over again. Well, that's the end of creativity because you're only copying yourself, and re going over the same, replowing the same furrow. And th there's nothing wrong with that. That's perfectly respectable. I imagine Stradivarius, when he made his violins, um, cranked out these absolute masterpieces. And uh, so I'm not saying that's evil or wrong or in any way bad, but to me, creativity involves freshness and new ideas and surprises. When you flip through one of, one of my books, you're never sure what's on the next page. It might be a moose, it might be some immature swans, uh, it might be a, an Indian canoe or um, a tree frog. You're not sure. And most artists, you pretty well know what's on the next page. Jackson Pollock, it's going to be Dribbles. With Tom Thompson, it would be uh, Algonquin Park in the fall or early spring or winter, not in the summer, etc. Fairly predictable. And that's okay. But I like being, um, I guess, having surprises and freshness. Quite a few of my paintings uh, are not, I guess you could say they're not nice. Um, and I think that's a virtue too. I don't think all art should be nice and sweet and pretty and decorative. I mean, that's fine, but it's boring. Some of the most important art in the world, like the crucifixion scenes and the Casso's Guernica, are not very nice, but they kind of get you. 
Um, and I, uh, I don't, basically, I'd say 95% of my work is the joys and beauties of nature. But, uh, but some of them are, are thought-provoking and kind of tough, like the, the one I did of Kibera, the slums in uh, Nairobi, uh, sometimes called A City, did an, an aerial view of that, and uh, the one of the drift net with the, the dead white Pacific dolphin and lace and albatross caught in the drift net, etc., etc. That's kind of, to me, like a crucifixion scene. It's a sacrifice these lives have made. But it's real. Yeah, that's right. And it's reality that we have to pay attention to and not, not always say, you know, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. All of my paintings are, uh, they're not my enemy, they're my opponents while I'm working on them. I like them when I first start. In fact, I like them best before I start. <laughs> Then they look okay, they have promise, and I'm working fairly loose brush strokes. So then I, I develop them a bit more and I end up, I start not liking them. There's something wrong with it, but I don't know what it is. And that's a horrible feeling. If I knew what it was, I'd fix it, but I don't, I don't like it and I don't know why. So I put it to one side and start a new one to cheer me up. And then I'm very happy and I like it. And then it goes bad. And by the fifth one, by the time it's looking really terrible, the first one doesn't look quite as bad as the fifth one. So I then go back to the first one, and so I leapfrog along doing these uh, different paintings. And they, I literally, I come into the studio every morning and I kind of glower at them, you know, and um, I try all different things. We, we, I've got a Buddhist prayer gong over there. I try everything I can to send out prayers or whatever that's going to help the muse come down from Mount Olympus to touch me with her inspiration. And sometimes, I mean, I'm talking on the phone because I can talk on the phone with my left hand and paint with my right hand. And this Zen-like thing comes through and my, not verbally, but my brain goes, aha, I think that's gonna work. I'm not sure, but I think it will work. So I'm always co correcting and evolving and changing and trying to improve. This particular moose is about the fifth attempt. How do you know when it's done? If I run out of my checklist, I've got a, I've got a, a running checklist in my brain as to things I still need doing. And uh, I have a mirror over there that I stand and look at it in the mirror. And often things occur to me that I didn't notice looking straight on. And, uh, and then other people, you know, uh, if my mother had a problem with not seeing the painting right, then it's not my mother's problem, it's my problem. I did a painting for Princess Grace one time, which we, Birgit and I presented to her in, in the Palace of Monaco. It was just one of the thrills of a lifetime. And uh, it's looking into, uh, into water. The foreground is rhododendrons, because I knew she liked flowers. And the, the bird in it is a golden crown kinglet. And the rhododendron is reflected in the water. Well, my mother thought the water was sky. She liked the painting, but in her comments, it, it seemed to be sky. Well, it's not sky, sky, it's water. But I can't blame my mother, I blame myself because I don't have clarity in the way it goes. And so I put just, I mean, it was pretty simple in this case, just put a little circular ripple and that couldn't be sky. It broke up the reflection and just, and so I solved it that way. There's no doubt that this is the home of not one, but two artists. Well, I remember when I married Robert Bateman, he was just an art teacher, just like me. We were two normal art teachers. I should say normal, maybe we weren't normal, but anyway. Who happened to fall in love? Who happened to fall in love? And uh, art being our commonality, the thing we love, nature being the other one, it really was a perfect fit. And uh, the fact that we could work so well together really was very, very lucky for us. I never felt the need to have my own shows. I always did art, but I think because being part of his, that was enough. You know, I didn't really want to stand in front of anything and say, this is my show. And uh, through time, it was only because of coming, uh, meeting the, the writer, Peter Matheson, and he said he wanted to use my photographs, that I realized I should really have a few more credentials than simply being a photographer who does her own thing. People have said to me that I have an unusual eye. I wouldn't have thought that myself, but that's what they say. So when I'm anywhere, 
I'm always seeing images. And of course, the, I think the luck of being an artist is that you don't see things just as what they are. You see them as composition, form, line, texture. So I'm always photographing everywhere I go. And in terms of seeing something unusual like this one, which will be in the Russian show, this is in uh, Venice, Italy, and it was at the market. But while everyone was doing the vegetables and fruit and the fish on the tables, I suddenly realized how amazing the color field aspect of these brilliant tones that was keeping the sun from hitting the, the fruit and vegetables, that excited me much more. And especially when antiquity is contrasted with something that is very contemporary. So the plastic of our world, the bright colors, the, the metal, as opposed to beautiful worn stones, you know, that have been used in nature. You have been honored and recognized not only for your art, but also as an environmentalist. Do you see that as a responsibility of wildlife artists like yourself? Uh, yes, I do, but that, I'm not unique. I think everybody who's alive has a responsibility to give. Now, some people who live in slums in Calcutta don't have much to give, but from reading, uh, for example, The City of Joy, which is a book about that, they do. People all over the world in these tragic situations are giving. But everybody has an obligation to give what they can, and whatever is within their talents or whatever is within their capacity to make the world be a better place or make uh, other people's lives better and richer. I, unquestionably think the world would be better play, a better place if everybody was a bird watcher. That's a, a very simple prescription for world peace and I think, uh, you know, whether you're Khrushchev or Nixon or Osama bin Laden or whoever you are, if you cared about nature, then you're, ca then you're caring a piece of your heart is caring about something that doesn't give a damn about you. If there's an issue that I can do something about to improve, I do it. If I can't, I don't do it. And then I need the wisdom to know the difference between the two. So I do what I can, and then I don't worry about it. We're only going to get change if everybody in whatever they do changes what they do 5% or maybe 15% to make the world a better place. That's the way it's go only way it's going to happen. And so let's hope that it, it can have some effect. The fingers crossed. <laughs> Nature isn't just his work. Like his home, he is one with nature, something he says we should all be, especially this generation. That dedication to the environment led to a partnership with Royal Roads University in Victoria, where the Bateman Centre is home to the Canadian Centre for Environmental Education. Uh, right now, I'm hearing purple finch, red-winged blackbird, song sparrow and I just heard a raven and you know they say the average North American kid can recognize over a thousand corporate logos but they don't know the names of their neighbors of other species and uh, you know they couldn't even name ten birds and trees that share their air and share their neighborhood and of course, I think that's dreadful. The average North American kid, I'm told, this is unbelievable, but I'm told they spend seven hours a day, seven days a week, they don't take the weekend off, looking at some kind of electronic screen. Getting to know your wild neighbors is one thing. That's how this whole thing started, the, the Bateman Get to Know program. I think it's gettoknow.ca, if there's a website there. Um, but... Um, it's got worse since then. That was 10 years ago. It's got way worse in the last five years, even. And now I think, it, I think of it as a juggernaut rolling over a large segment of our younger generation. And it doesn't bode well for the future. As for the Robert Bateman legacy, there is his nature-loving circle of family and friends, his paintings, of course, but for the artist himself, it's the hope that his work influences the way we live our lives in harmony with nature in the years to come that matters the most. I, I think it's a pretty good prediction that because we're, we're right now over the peak of peak oil, 
oil from now on is going to get expensive. There will, there will be oil here for centuries probably, but the price is just going to go up and up and up. We've got the low-hanging fruit is behind us. A couple of wonderful books that I got from two totally different sources, so there's a lot of people starting to think this way. One is by uh, Jeff Rubin, who is an economist uh, of the Canadian Bank, and he wrote a book called Why Your World is Going to Get a Whole Lot Smaller. Then there's another book that a friend of mine in Spain gave me, which is from a, um, an Englishman called Rob Hopkins. It's called The Transition Handbook, Moving from Oil Dependency to Local Resilience, which is what we're thinking about in Salt Spring Island here, local resilience. And in, um, in uh, The Transition Handbook, there's a graph, and I'll do it uh, backwards. Let's see, so zero is here, that's the time of Christ. Four, the year 4000 is here, is a straight line going along. And in the middle, of course, is the year 2000. That's, we'll say that's where we are now. All right, and the, the graph is totally empty, except for a black pointy thing going up like that, a very steep pointy thing. That's the age of oil. It came around 1900. According to this theory, it'll be gone by the end of the 21st century. So it was here 200 years. My mom was born in 1900 into a world that was thousands of years old. They cooked over a flame. The light came from the flame. No electricity, of course, because they had no telephone and so on. She grew up in an upper middle class family in Spring Hill, Nova Scotia. It was horse and sleigh or horse and wagon. And, and by sail, in the, uh, that's how you got from place to place in the ocean. And that went back thousands of years. And my same mother saw a man walk on the moon. So incredible things happened once the age of oil got going. We're now here. And the prediction is that my grandchildren's lives, you know, in another 50 years or so, will be more like my grandmother's life than like ours. We'll be a lot smarter and wiser from the research and communications. Uh, it's just that all travel will be way more expensive. And so, um, Forget about the, uh, the big box stores that import all their stuff cheaply. Um, you'll be able to go to stores uh, right here in Canada, local stores, and see made in Canada. Made in British Columbia here, made in Ontario, if they're, because transportation costs will be so much. So uh, the Walmarts of this world will have to buy local. The Chinese will have to sell local. And they're already doing that. They're smart. Um, but it also will mean uh, more jobs, more manufacturing locally. Farmland will be local. If you want to have strawberries in the wintertime, you can have strawberries in the wintertime as long as you, as you pay $500 a box because transportation costs will be very, very high. Um, but uh, we can enjoy strawberries like my grandmother did, you know, <laughs> during season and in preserves. Um, and so, there'll be a greater sense of community, a greater sense of, of family cohesion, much less traveling all over the place and getting away from it all type of thing. So I think it, it has great possibilities of being a much sweeter world than we have now.